invite you to open your Bibles to the second chapter of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John and the second chapter. I remember once coming across a magazine ad that pictured a big, burly man with a square jaw, stubbled beard, dressed in convict clothes, stripes and all, the absolute personification of toughness. But in this ad, he was pictured doing something very tender. He was gently cradling a newborn baby. And the slogan, as I remember, was something like, tough and yet so tender. It's common to hear ads like that, you know, tough on stains, yet gentle on delicate fabrics. Trucks and SUVs are often advertised as being tough enough for any kind of road, any kind of terrain, but smooth and quiet enough for exceptional comfort. One you're probably all familiar with, the ad, strong enough for a man, yet made for a woman. Tough and yet so tender. We're studying the Gospel of John this morning, the second chapter. And in chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, we find that Jesus was both tough and tender. Our lesson this morning, like Christ, Christians should be a blend of tenderness and toughness. First of all, to be Christ-like is to be tender. John, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse, Follow along as I read through the 11th verse, John chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing three or four firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. I would suggest that this story of Jesus' first miracle helps us to see the tenderness of Jesus. First, we note that Jesus attended. We're told that Jesus came to the wedding at least in part to let people know that he was interested in the happiness of people. He shares our joys and our happiness. And secondly, when the wine was all gone, Jesus cared. He was concerned about the problems of people. And then thirdly, he did a kindness for his mother. Now, Mary's request of Jesus probably came with rather mixed motivation. She must have had a number of reasons for wanting Jesus to work a miracle. First of all, she was concerned that the reception go well. She was one of the hostesses 
and things were going to fall apart, the wine was gone. Secondly, she was a mother. And she was proud of her son, and she wanted to show him off for the company. You know, Johnny, play your piece on the piano for these nice people. She was a proud mother. And then also Mary, no doubt, wanted Jesus to announce his messiahship. She had lived with that secret now in her heart for more than 30 years. She could share it with very few, and Joseph was no longer there to share it with. In fact, Mary's reputation would only really be clean and upright when Jesus announced his messiahship. How many folks in that sinful community of Nazareth do you suppose really believe that this baby conceived out of wedlock came by means of the Holy Spirit? Only when people accepted the divinity of Christ would the purity of Mary's past be exonerated. She must have had somewhat mixed motivations as she approached Jesus with her request. But the point that we want to make this morning is, in spite of it all, Jesus did a kindness for his mother, a kindness for those in charge of the wedding feast, a kindness for the guests, because Jesus was thoughtful, Jesus was tender. There are some folk who look upon tenderness as weakness, but this is not Christian. To be Christ-like is to be tender. Like Jesus, Christians should be a blend of tenderness and toughness. Now notice that to be Christ-like is to be tough. Would you follow along in your Bibles as we read the next part of the chapter beginning with the 12th verse? And remember, this takes place immediately after Jesus revealed his tenderness. John 2, verses 12 through 17. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And so Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things, hence make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The issue here was not really so much selling as it was cheating. Some people want to take this passage to indicate that we shouldn't take up offerings or there shouldn't be any handling of money in church, but that's not the emphasis here. The emphasis is not so much upon the selling that was going on as upon the extortion and the fraud that was taking place. You see, these folks who came down to Jerusalem for the Passover they came from all over the world. Some of them traveled day after day after day. It wouldn't be practical for, for them to bring animals with them for their offerings. Others simply didn't raise animals. And so they arrived at the temple without the required sacrifice. Someone then had to logically provide the sacrifice. So that was not necessarily bad, but in the temple courtyard? And also throughout Palestine, and some people came from much further away than just Palestine, there were all kinds of different coinage. The only coinage used at the temple was a special temple coinage. And so the money had to be exchanged for the proper coinage, and so then there needed to be an exchanger of the money. Trouble if it is, have you ever traveled in a foreign country? I remember going down to Mexico once many years ago, and I didn't even know how to pay the taxi driver. I simply showed him some American currency, and he pointed at the ones he wanted. <laughs> when it comes to exchanging money, we can be very easily ripped off. And that's exactly what was happening at the temple. 
And this was the thing that concerned Jesus so. Or somebody would come in with the lamb that they had brought for a sacrifice and present the lamb to the priest. And as the priest was required to do, they would check very carefully the animal to make sure this was a perfect lamb without spot or blemish because it represented Jesus. And so the priest would go around looking and feeling until finally he came to what he said was a blemish. And he would say, oh, the lamb has to be perfect. And I think this lamb might just be favoring his right front foot just a bit. Well, of course, he'd been walking for a week. I'm sorry, we cannot accept this for a sacrifice. It has to be perfect. Well, the man came to worship. He came to bring a sacrifice to atone for his family's sins. What could he do? Well, you see, there's a traitor right over there. He might just let you trade in your lamb for a perfect one. So the man went over to that merchant. And the merchant took his lamb and gave him another, you know, for a $100 bill. They never give you very much for a trade-in. This second lamb, lamb B, was brought then to the priest and then sacrificed. Meanwhile, lamb A disappeared was kept in a pen in the back until the first worshiper had left, and then that lamb A was sold to the next worshiper as a perfect lamb. And the priest would sp split the profit with the merchant. And it was this kind of deception, all in the name of worship, that raised the ire of Jesus. The scripture says he picked up some small cords and twisted them into some form of scourge. Take these things out of my father's house. And he raised that scourge and the people saw him as if he had a flaming sword. And between their guilt, the condemnation of his presence, the authority with which Jesus spoke, the people just went running. Their guilty conscience was enough to drive the priests and sellers out of the temple. Notice the 17th verse again. And his disciples remembered that it was written, and this is uh, Psalm 69, verse 9. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Jesus would not allow his father's house to be abused. Jesus would not allow his father's house to be neglected. I wonder if zeal for God's house consumes many of us today. Do we zealously watch the things that we say when we come to God's house? Do we zealously watch the things we do in God's house? And do we care enough about God's house to support it with our offerings? And now Jesus gives us a beautiful example of how to handle abuse. The 16th verse again. It said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Notice he says, make not my father's house. What is the right reaction to abuse? The difference between people is not that some are abused and some are not abused. The difference is in our reaction to abuse. What was Jesus' reaction to abuse? If it was abuse against himself, Jesus accepted abuse. If it was abuse against others, Jesus fought for the rights of others. On Calvary, when they so terribly abused him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. But in the temple, when they abused the poor, when they abused his father's house, Jesus stood up in holy indignation. The natural tendency of us is, if people abuse me, I'm going to fight back. If they abuse other people, it's their problem. The attitude of Jesus was, I will fight when others are abused. You cannot appreciate Christ's tenderness until you can accept Christ's toughness. Jesus had a side to him that was pure, tough. Desire of Ages, page 161 says, with a zeal and severity, severity, 
with a zeal and severity he has never before manifested. He overthrows the tables. We have no record that he hit the people, but he sure did make a mess of that courtyard. There was violence in Jesus' act, the toughness of Jesus. But there was tenderness, too. When the priests and these other rascals had been chased out, after they had calmed down a bit and pulled themselves together, they began to kind of slowly steal their way back into the courtyard. And you know what they found. The picture here is so beautiful as presented in Desire of Ages. Quote, slowly and thoughtfully, still with hate in their hearts, they returned to the temple for what a change had taken place during their absence. When they fled, the poor remained behind. Interesting enough how Jesus spoke to those who were doing these misdeeds in the temple courtyard. They all left because of their guilt. The people that were not guilty stayed behind. They were not at all afraid of Jesus. The poor remained behind, and these were now looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not. His ear heard every cry. With pity exceeding that of a tender mother, he bent over the suffering little ones. All received attention. Everyone was healed of whatever disease he had. The dumb opened their lips in praise. The blind beheld the face of their restorer. The hearts of the sufferers were made glad. What a beautiful scene. Can you just picture it in your mind? The tenderness and the toughness of Jesus. It says he bent over the little ones like a tender mother. I presume there's no better example anywhere of tender toughness than motherhood. Volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 536, the tenderest earthly tie is that between the mother and her child. The child is more readily impressed by the life and example of the mother than that of the father. For a stronger and more tender bond of union unites them. This tender toughness exists even among animals. We see a mother bear or a lioness so very gently and tenderly licking and touching and playing with and caring for her young so very tender. But woe to the person or the animal that tries to abuse her baby. There is nothing tougher than a mother's love. That's the way Jesus loves, with a tender toughness. Jesus loves his children with such care and tenderness, but woe to those who abuse him, them. He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye, Zechariah 2.8. Like Christ, Christians should be a blend of tenderness and toughness. Oh, how the world needs tender toughness. Wives need tender, tough husbands. Women want you men to be tough. They want to feel that you're stronger than they feel that they are. Otherwise, they will feel insecure. They lose respect. They want toughness, but they also want tenderness. Somebody has said that there, if there ever were a nuclear holocaust that destroyed every person on the face of the earth, the last man alive would spend his last hour frantically searching for his wife, calling out, no doubt, in a great frenzy. And men, when you lie on your deathbed, you will not ask to see your car or your house or your possessions. You will not ask to see your boat. You will not ask for an update on the box scores in the sports section or take a look at your bank account. The final thing that you will want is to see your wife and talk to your children. And if these things are that important to us at the times of ultimate 
Why don't we make tenderness more a part of our lives in the everyday? How happy our homes would be if we had fathers, if we had husbands who were tender, tough. Citizens need tender, tough government. And though I suppose none of us really like it, the Christian citizen must accept the toughness of law because Jesus did. He obeyed a government that was unpopular. It was unfair. It was corrupt. And still he obeyed. He even paid his taxes when he didn't really owe them because he kept the local law. And he told us that when someone forces us to go part way, we should go further. With the Roman soldiers, it was legal to command a person to carry his pack for a mile. And I'm sure the pack must have been a very heavy pack. Did Jesus say, unfair law? He said, no, go two miles instead of one. And Paul said that we ought to be obedient to the powers that be. And again, he was talking about a corrupt an unkind, a dictatorial government. Christians do not disobey laws just because they disagree. They may want to improve the lawmaking process. They may want to replace the lawmaker when they vote. But the Christian keeps the law. A citizen who has no respect for human law cannot teach others to respect divine law. One of the silliest scenes I know of is of the preacher driving down the road going 90 miles an hour preaching to the people in the car about obedience. Citizens must accept the toughness of law. But Christians who are in government must not allow toughness to overshadow tenderness. A policeman is required to enforce the law, or at least in some places I hear they still do. But if he is a truly Christian policeman, he does it in a spirit of kindness and love and respect. Just a few weeks ago, I got pulled over for the first time in many years. My wife and I were heading into town to visit with my sister who was in from out of town. We were going to eat together. And so I had to make the appointment in time. But I really wasn't worried about trying to go fast. I was just involved in conversation with my wife and just lost track, you know, of how fast I was going. Usually I've got the cruise on, so I don't have to worry about it. But in this case, I had to accelerate to go up the hill from where I live, and then the speed limit changed, and I just didn't pay attention. And then I saw all of a sudden I turned away from where I was talking to my wife and looked, and there on the side of the road, there was the sheriff's. And you get that sinking feeling right away. Man, I hit the brake so fast, slowed down, but sure enough, Looked in the rearview mirror, turned around, here he comes. Oh my goodness. And he pulled us over. But you know, he was very respectful. He was very kind. I found if you treat them with respect and kindness, you'll usually get treated that way yourself. See, a lot of these problems with people getting in trouble with the law enforcement, and usually it's because they're not obeying the law and they're not being respectful to the officers. This man was very kind. He says, I know you got some place to go. I'm going to make it as quick as I can. And then when he got done, he said, I'm just going to give you a warning today. So not only was he kind, not only was he respectful, but he extended grace to me. And I was able to go and enjoy a good meal with my sister and my wife without feeling about how Miserable I was because I'd been pulled over. The church needs tender, tough pastors and church leaders. Sometimes, just like in any workplace, there can be serious employee problems even within the church. We ought to pray for our church administrators. What do you do with the unproductive person being paid to finish the gospel, paid with sacred money? The pastor who goes year after year and never baptizes a single soul. What do you do? You know what the church has tended to do. We just move them from church to church to church. Until there's not a church in the conference that will take them. And then we move them to the next conference. But now laymen are a little more involved in what they have to say about the operation of their conferences. I find 
that some are being let go and maybe they wouldn't be, be in the past, which is a tough thing to do. How hard it is to know how to be both tender and tough when it comes to employees within the church. How difficult it is to know how to be both tender and tough when it comes to discipline problems within the local congregation. The deacon must be tough when the children are running up and down the halls, and yet he must be tender that he doesn't wound that poor little heart and make him not even want to come to church anymore. Almost every time I've been involved in a church discipline problem, some of them very serious over the years, whether they involve a reprimand or censure or even disfellowship, my heart goes out to the parties involved, and I want to say, Lord, can't we just make an exception this time? And then I'm reminded that any standard unenforced is a standard abandoned. How difficult it is to let people know that we love them, all the while taking a strong stand against the sin that's hurting them. It's so easy in cases of church discipline, it's so easy to be tender. It's not even too difficult to be tough but I find it sometimes nearly impossible to be tender tough. And that's the Christ-like way. Christ needs tender tough Christians. Ministry of Healing, page 297, says the Christian life is more than many take it to be. It does not consist wholly in gentleness, patience, meekness, and kindliness. These graces are essential, but there is need also for courage, for force, for energy, for perseverance, for toughness. And so Christ was tender, but Christ was also tough. I maintain that tens of thousands of men and women have rejected the tender picture of Christ that has been painted too much by many churches, knowing that there has to be more to a well-rounded character than only tenderness. And so John in the second chapter says, absolutely, the true Christ was tender, tough. Like Christ, Christians should be a blend of tenderness and toughness. As we end our worship this morning, if your heart has been tough, if it has been hard, if it has been willful and independent, let the tenderness of Jesus in. Open your life to him. And if you have done that, then maybe what you need is toughness to stand up for principle or to stand up for the rights of others who are being abused. And there's another kind of toughness that the Christian needs, the toughness to keep going. I killed a rabbit the other day, not on purpose, you understand. I was driving down the road and a rabbit started to cross in front of me. Now I slowed down a little, probably not enough. And I swerved to the other side of the road and the rabbit had plenty of distance. He was almost all the way across the road. I knew that he was safe. But somehow at the last moment, he turned back. You know how those rabbits are, very unpredictable. Isn't that a horrible sound of an animal being crushed beneath the wheels of your car? Bad feeling. Why? Because he turned back. Brethren and sisters, if you have started toward heaven, it could be fatal to turn back. That poor little fellow was almost there, but he lost his life because he turned back. There's someone here today who has been with the Lord for maybe a long while. You've been headed toward heaven, but today you've come to worship with a little discouragement in your heart. Or maybe you come with a special temptation that's welling up so great in front of you that you're tempted to just turn back. Oh, I plead with you today, be tough, persevere. Heaven will be worth it all. May God give each of us the tenderness 
to set our sights on heaven and the toughness to keep on going. May we all, like Jesus, be tender, tough.